um, what I would like to hear you guys, see you guys do is, or maybe we can call on someone. I mean, I'm going to just start it off with this, guys. Right now, we're in a challenging market, right, where there's low inventory. Um, you know, every home's getting freaking 20, 30 offers pretty much anywhere you, you work at. Um, like, let's talk about that, guys. I, I think that's maybe the big thing going on is, is, number one, is how do we get more buyers in contract? Maybe some strategies around that. What are we doing to separate ourselves, you know, from the next guy? Because there's, I know in our market, there's 20,000 licensed agents um, and maybe tips and strategies around maybe how to get more listings and stuff like that. Like, I will, let's kick it off maybe around some of those topics. Feel free to, you know, chime in whatever you see fit. I'll jump in just because I like to hear myself talk. Um, you know, uh, uh, the biggest thing I'm, I'm coaching right now is, um, is rapport building, like rapport, 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 rapport. Um, I, not only do you have to be high level education for your clients, making sure they're going up. For example, I have a $2.5 million listing that we're submitting an offer on today. And I got my clients to go to 3 million, 15,000. That's the offer price we're going in at, right? How do you get to the point where your client believes in you enough to take that advice to go up $500,000 on offer. It's rapport building, right? It all starts there. So as an agent, you know, it's rapport building with the listing agent on the other side, right? So if you're a buyer's agent, like if you don't know the agent on the other side and you're just throwing in an offer, hold on one second. Um, if you're just throwing in an offer blindly and not speaking with that listing agent at all, you're not going to win. It doesn't even matter if you're the best number because they're going to go to the agent that they know, like, and trust that's beneath to have them come up over your number. That's what's happening behind the scenes, guys. So if you're not building rapport with that listing agent up front, first and foremost, you're dead in the water. So build the rapport with the agent, build the rapport with the client, and that way you can dictate where that offer is going to go. And then if they're not going to win the offer, be brutally honest with them and say, guys, we're just not going to win at this number. We can give it a shot, but let's be, let, you know, let's, let's be better on the next one. So just a quick little 60 second tip there, focus on the rapport with the client. So they'll trust you when the number needs to go up and then focus on building rapport with that listing agent. So they will come to you with that first opportunity to win the deal. I love that, man. Those are some, some great tips. Let's peel that back a little bit, right? So let's talk about maybe rapport building strategies with the listing agent. What are some of you guys doing to build rapport with the listing agent? What's your little ninja tactics that you're doing to, to, to get, because sometimes, right, correct me if I'm wrong, you got agents that just don't answer their phone, right? You got listing agents, they're, they're swamped with phone calls. They're getting, you know, hundreds of emails. They're just not answering. So what are some of the things that you guys have been doing to, to kind of weasel your way in there and, and talk to the listing agent? I'll go, like, um, I'll, I'll paste a funny story that we sent to for like a Zillow, um, press release thing but on our like our side channel we always try to find out like if does any we always post like does anyone know this agent and we really try to leverage re other people's relationships so we will like recently um i had a listing in san leandro we had like five offers come in but someone in actually just, that just recently joined my team said hey my friend simon uh is writing an offer can you take a closer look at it so we really try to figure out who in the market knows who and, and reach out to that person it, it might be like a LinkedIn, uh, sorry, not like the Instagram DM or Facebook DM. Hey, can, some, can someone please talk to this agent for me? So like, cause then you know, 30 offers come in, you're just in our offer, but at least if Enrique or Elias calls, Hey, you should talk to this guy, Kenny, he has an offer coming in from his team member. So I always say leverage other people's relationships. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, to build off of that, find a way to edify the listing agent. What I mean by that is find a way to find out how much business have they done in that particular area um, looking at all the comps, being able to be like, hey, it looks like you derived your list price based on the comp over at 123 Main Street. Is that about right? Cool. Awesome. Can I find out a little bit more about your client? Seeing as we can't put a letter together and know who my people are, I'm going tell you a little bit about them. And then what one of our top agents in Hayward is doing is that she's sending a video to the listing agent on Vidyard or just directly from her phone. Hey guys, it's Carmen Hernandez. We just got off the phone. I just want to put a face to the name so you guys recognize me when I submit your offer. I don't give a shit if I have to walk your dog, come home, clean your car, whatever it's going to take to get my offer accepted. But I just want to let you know that I'm here. I'm she said that, person. by the way. She actually said that in the video. She said that, you know? And so it's about finding ways to stand out to where you're not just another stack and then making sure 
that when you deliver your paperwork, you have this clean, clean, um, you know, cover letter of all the highlights of your offer. It's combined in one PDF, not separate PDF, separate PDFs. And here's the highlights of my offer attached with the video. And here's who I am and, and making sure that there's a true, true personal touch to it. So those are things that are helping us build a better relationship with the listing agent. And that video is, that's real talk, you guys. I think that, that tip, those two tips right there are so gold. Like though that reach, I, I mean, I, Kenny's tip on seeing who, you know, who, who knows them, I think is freaking awesome. Um, that's so smart. And, and, and of course we're assuming you're going to do this in the cleanest form, right? We're starting with the base level of we're competent agents. We're writing clean offers. We're putting in the right shit in the email, right? Like we're starting at a base level there. And I think the next thing above that is how are you going to separate yourself then from the agents who are doing the right things, right? And, and the other good tip you can use, which um, you guys just brought up, is looking at their production. If they're a low producing agent, like let's say they only sell three to five homes a year, see what you can bring to them value-wise, right? Hey, do you want to take a look at our listing presentation, our buyer presentation, like trying to contribute to their business saying, hey, how can we help you grow? I think is a, a huge, right? Like just trying to contribute back to them, um, especially if you're on one of these higher producing teams, like, you know, use it as an opportunity to build relationships with them and help their business well beyond that listing. I think all of that is, is great. I want to add something in there, guys. Uh, these are all excellent tips, guys, by the way. So I hope you guys are taking notes. Um, I think the energy and the vibe that you bring to that conversation is important as well. Um, I don't work with a lot of buyers, you know, at this point in my career, but the ones that I have worked with recently, you know, close friends and family, um, that I've been successful with is when I call the, the listing agent, like I'm trying to just be their best friend right off the bat. Like, I'm not just trying to sound super professional. Um, it's like, Hey, how's it going? Are you getting a ton of calls on this property? Like, I'm just trying to really, you know, empathize with them and put myself in their shoes. Um, because I think what happens is a lot of listing agents will have this like auto response that they do, right? Send me your highest and best, you know, like they're just, they're just tired of it, right? So how do you get them out of that auto response? What are you doing to break the ice when you're talking to them so that they drop their guard and they just become a human, another human, right? Because when you could have that human to human relationship and you could laugh at like some dumb shit on the side that has nothing to do with the transaction, like that's where you're going to stand out. You're, you're letting them know what it's going to be like to work with you, right? Because let's face it, guys, some of these transactions are stressful, right? Like uh, I've never, ever had a smooth transaction. Like they've always had some sort of hurdle or bump or something happens on everyone. I've just put that in my mind from day one. But if you can like make it seem to this agent like, hey, we're going to have a good time. Or even you tell them on the call, hey, I promise if you work with me, we're going to have fun and we're going to go out for drinks at the end of this thing. Like that's going to separate you from the person that's just, acting like a robot and that's helped me win a, a few a few of my buyers when i've submitted them all right who else guys what's a, what's another ninja tactic you're doing to to build relationships or or get your offers accepted let's let's peel this onion back a little bit i haven't done this but i heard on clubhouse from nec six 600 million dollar uh last year team producer um, they're doing crazy stuff like uh, non-refundable deposits and I think six, second deposit stuff like that. So again, I haven't done it, but that's going to make your offer stand out. And I've heard recently from our team that we're uh, maybe in the city or South Bay that people are putting way, way more than 3% uh, initial deposit to make the offer stand out. Um, Isaac Guzman on the Dan Beer team brought this up and that was really weird, but like weird is good because it stands out. They're doing stuff like uh, buyers writing that they'll pay seller closing costs and then the they sell closing costs is not that much money, but it just makes your offer like, just like, what the hell is this? And it just like, it makes a seller stop and think for a little bit. I like that guys. And then, I mean, in the contract, right. It does say that if anything were to able ever to happen, only 3% of the deposit is really what's on the line. Right. So if you put a 5% deposit or a 10% deposit, that just makes you look stronger. Um, you know, and you're going to want to verify this, right? I'm, I'm not, I'm not acting as your broker right now, but um, from my understanding, only 3% is really what's, what's in the contract, right? If it ever goes to medi mediation or arbitration. So you might just use that 5% upfront deposit or 10% upfront deposit to make your offer look strong. 
um, but just educate your clients on really what's on the line. Excellent, excellent. Um, guys, in the chat, uh, make sure you guys have the chat open as well, guys, because people are dropping some tips in here as well, uh, links to stuff. Um, who wants to maybe talk about maybe a challenge they're having right now in, in their business? This is where you volunteer and participate for the for the greater good. Be vulnerable. What what are you struggling with right now in your business? Come on, everybody. You guys got something. I know. <laughs> That's right, Jose. Way to step up. Let's go, Jose. <laughs> yeah, I think um, one challenge we're having in our business right now is um, we've got about we've got like four listings uh, coming up. But just having a hard time getting the um, the sellers to kind of move and get their stuff out. One of them get their tenant out of there, um, and then just having a hard time just getting the ball rolling on on these. You know, they're you know some of these listings we've signed you know a couple of weeks ago, and just they're kind of sitting there. And you know, I call them up and say, hey, you know, the market is what it is right now. Let's get this moving with you know moving on. So um, just kind of you know, maybe any tips on how we can move the needle a little bit faster with some of these clients. Who wants to offer a tip? Are, are you waiting to get um, obviously photography done and everything? So they've signed your listing agreement, right? And do you have a marketing timeline that states of all the dates that are gonna be happening subsequently after you signing the listing agreement? So do you have a series of events that are going to happen as soon as they sign the listing agreement? Let's let's not include the one that has a tenant in it, but anyone that doesn't have a tenant. Do they know what the action plan is as soon as you get the listing agreement signed? Uh, no, we don't have like a uh, true like action plan like that. It's more of we've gone met with them, got the listing agreement, yep. and then they say, okay, and we tell them, okay, you need to, you know, if they're moving out, you got to clean it out. Um, or if they're still living in it, like, you know, trying to, to tell them to hurry up and, and get out, but nothing where we're saying, hey, here's our timeline and this is what we got to do now. So, so typically what we do is we do a 14 day, um, you know, 14 days is pretty much the soonest we can put on market and, and do all the marketing plan. So what we do is we come in with a marketing timeline, right? All right, we signed the listing agreement today. Photographs are going to happen on X date. Then we're going to have a copywriter do a copyright. Then we're going to have you guys proof the copyright. Then I'm going to have inspectors come in. Then I'm going to have it staged or I'm going to have it virtually staged on this day. On this date is going to be the first day of our, our first weekend of showings. We're going to do one week of showings and we're going to do an offer review date on this day. Obviously, some things can change based on the calendar, but I'd like to keep to a tight, tight calendar because when we enter the market, how we enter the market is going to play a big factor on what you guys are going to get over list price. So here's the plan. That way it gives them a little bit more pressure versus I sign the listing agreement, but there's no next step is what am I going to do next, right? Give them a definitive of what's going to happen. Obviously, there might be some variables, might have to run an audible, but give them a plan so that helps them move forward and you're helping them based on your plan because you said it was so, they said it's so important for them to sell their home. Let's stick to this plan. Great, thank you, appreciate that. That's and I'll, I'll, send right there. I'll, I'll send it to you, bro. We have a whole marketing timeline and, and net sheet that we do for all of our listings. Um, so shoot me your email and I'll get that over to you. Okay, appreciate it, thank you. You got it. Um, I wanted to point something out guys, what Elias was saying right now is do you notice how Elias is taking the leadership position when he's speaking to his clients, right? It's the clients at the end of the day, when they're hiring you, they want a leader. They want someone who's gonna pull, hold their hand, pull them and lead them to the finish line. So I think it's important to position yourself, especially for a listing as the driver, the one who's gonna take this thing forward and who's gonna lead the sale. And the way he explains it, right? He explains it back to their benefit, right? He's saying like, we're gonna do this, this, and this, and this, and this. Why? Because this is what you asked for. This is what you want, or you wanted to get top dollar. So right now the market's doing this right now. We don't know what's gonna happen in three months, six months or whatever, you know? So if we wanna capture today's market and the comps that I showed you and the price expectations that I showed you, 
we need to follow this timeline so that we can achieve your goals. Does that make sense, Mr. Seller? Does that make sense, Mrs. Seller? Right. So he's taking he's taking an authoritative role in in that in that there, right? And so some of us some of us are doing a great job at getting the listing, right? But then we're not we're not being the leader and taking that to the close, right? At the end of the day, a listing agreement signed is no good if you don't get that thing on the market, right? So um, I would say aside from implementing that timeline that a lot that you know we're talking about. Um, you got to just come from a place of you're the leader in, in this thing, right? And this is why you hired me. And they'll let you know, right? The client will give you feedback and let you know, oh, that's too fast or no, we don't. And then you're going to have to readjust and recalibrate. Um, it's also important to ask, not when you want to start selling your house, when would you like your home to be sold? When do you want to have the money in the bank, right? Um, and you always want to talk about what the next move is, right? So if, if they're selling their home to buy another home, you need to focus on what, you know, why they're selling their home and where they're going, right? So Mr. Client, when do you want your home sold? When do you need the money in the bank so that we can put our down payment on the next home, right? So I think those little tweaks, man, it's, it's going to really change, you know, the direction. And then you'll be able to filter out who's serious and who's not at the end of the day. And I was just going to actually say what, what my coach told me, which is like, if you have an unrealistic buyer or seller, you know, the only solution to that is getting more business. If you have a massive pipeline, you're not going to be spending your time with D's and C's and even B clients. You're going to be spending your time with your A clients who are ready to buy or sell. So if you're struggling with a bunch of dud buyers or sellers, the only solution to that is more prospecting. I mean, that's just it. There's nothing better than that. That's right. That's right. All right. Let's uh, let's move on to a different one. Someone unmute yourself. Tell me what's going on. What are you struggling with right now? What's a challenge you're having? Where do you need coaching in? What's an area you'd like to improve in? So I have one, Enrique, a challenge that I've been seeing um, in this current market. So um, with FHA buyers, you guys know, in certain parts of the Bay Area right now, we have the lift program. So um, obviously you can use that with FHA also. So what I've been seeing is that we're having, it's a bit more of a struggle to get FHA accepted or, you know, to even compete right now, you know, because first of all, they're coming in with less money down. It's impossible to release all the contingencies. So it's super challenging. Um, you know, what uh, Danny just said, uh, you know, certain buyers, if, if they're not wanting to move now, then let them go. So, you know, some FHA buyers get discouraged and they're just like, I'm not gonna, you know, I'm not gonna buy. But as far as getting your offer accepted, anything that you guys have been seeing or different strategies that might be helpful, um, obviously raising the deposit, but, you know, with certain certain loans, we can't release all the contingencies. So that is one challenge that I've definitely been seeing in this um, market that we're in. Who wants to shed some light on that? Who's had success with FHA buyers or maybe a strategy with FHA buyers? So everyone's struggling with FHA buyers <laughs> or no one deals oh, with FHA buyers? Hey, en Enrique, it's Tabitha. So in, here in San Jose, Santa Clara County, it's very competitive. So I'm only A buyers. In the Valley, I have A buyers, but what we're doing is, so we know that usually what agents are doing in the Valley, this is just for me. Every agent that we've offered on, I, you have to kind of show the clients because they don't believe you have to over ask. Right. But even in the Valley. So after they've lost three times, because I'm going to show them this is what's going on, even though I'm explaining the data they are they want to buy, but they're just don't want to listen. By that time, their FHA, we are the highest offer now. We're going 30, 40,000 over asking because we have that cush. We've reduced our list price. So if they're looking at, you know, four, their max is 500. We're looking in the fours. We're, we're we, I won. We're winning because we're the top offer as a FHA loan. And even when it's appraisal in the Valley, every agent is responding to you. Once they accept your offer, they're going to ask you, no matter what it appraises at, you're going to pay $10,000 over. It right. seems crazy when you're explaining that to the buyer because they're afraid. Okay. 10,000, that's a lot of money, but yet I'm getting under in the Valley. 
under what we actually offered because we're going over. And that's just off the FHA, but we're going at a lower price house too. So we're not competing. I mean, I mean we have to be realistic. We've lost. We know this number isn't going to work. We're FHA. So you have a lot of rules. Uh, we just can't go in. Um, so for me, that's been a strategy that's worked. But again, they have to see it that it's not working here in, in the Valley or, you know, in, in the Santa Clara County. And um, so that's really it. You got to show the agent that we're strong, even though we're FHA. So we're going at a lower price house. So then you might have to be realistic that maybe this isn't the market, you know, if you're not wanting at that FHA loan, because really they want con a, a conventional, you know, strong down um, and trying to build that rapport. So thank you guys. I I'm hearing some excellent things. I'm going to be walking somebody's dog, but that's what that's what's been working for me. We're looking at a lower price house, we're FHA, and we're the strongest number. Yeah, I, I want to add to that, guys. Um, I think definitely just if your max is, let's say, a million or let's say 500,000, right? If your max is 500,000 and you're looking at homes that are 475, it's going to go over 500,000, right? So you're going to have to reverse engineer, like, what's my very max? And then what are homes typically, you know, going over in that neighborhood? If they're going over 10%, you're going to have to look at homes that are 10% less. And then you got to ask your question, well, are there any homes available that are in that price range? Um, another strategy, guys, that I would, I would use is instead of trying to do what everyone else is doing and compete against everyone, I would try to find opportunities where I'm not competing, right? So I would go into a neighborhood that they want. I would pull up every expired listing, every canceled listing, every withdrawal listing in the last two years. And I would go leave a note on their door saying, hey, I have a beautiful young family that's looking to get into the neighborhood. They're first time buyers. They're having trouble. I saw your home was on the market. This is legitimate interest. You know, are you still considering selling your home? We can give you a great price on your home and make it flexible, you know, on the terms. So you're going to have to figure out other ways to create opportunities for your buyers if, if that's not working. Um, another strategy or tip would be, can you... Because here's the thing, when people see FHA and, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, if I see FHA, it, there's automatically a stigma with FHA, right? You're, you don't have as much money or you're not as strong or your credit score is not as good or you're not as qualified or your debt to income ratio is, is higher. So there's loans out there where you can maybe do 5% down and you're still conventional, right? Like, so can we do a conventional loan instead of doing FHA, even with the same down payment? Um, I think I've heard of a 3% conventional loan before or a 5%. So if they got 3%, what's another 2%? Maybe they need to get a gift or maybe they need to, you know, pull out from their 401k or something, but that might make the difference between them getting a home or not. So I think it's, um, instead of just trying to go into the fire, it's just like trying to find, you know, outside of the box solutions to, to make that deal happen. To prove your last point, Enrique, you're absolutely right. Uh, the offer I just got accepted uh, the agent told me, yeah, we were neck and neck with price with another offer. Uh, my buyer only has 5%, but it's conventional. And because the agent cross-referenced with our lender, uh, the listing agent said, hey, because your lender actually answered the phone and he took my call and he knew everything about your buyers, it's literally the deciding factor that we accepted your offer. Uh, so it is possible to get 3 or 5% on a conventional. Yep. And, and you brought up a good point right there. And that's, that's another thing that we got to add is you need to have a strong lender. And when I say strong, meaning they can deliver right on the timelines, but also they can help you sell the client to the listing agent, right? On every one of our, our transactions where we represent a buyer, the lender is reaching out. When we submit it, we'll CC the lender and then we'll call you know, the listing agent and let them know, hey, offer came in, you know, keep building that report. The lender will also call the listing agent and sell the client to the, to the listing agent, right? So if you're not having your lender do that right now, you need to do that because that's what a listing agent is worried about, right? Can you perform, right? And that can make the difference. If it's neck and neck and you guys are both at the same price, but you did these few extra things, that's going to make the difference between you getting accepted or not. There's just one other thing I would add is if you're a VA or FHA, we don't have too many FHAs, but um, we have a lot of VA buyers just because some affiliations we have, but we've gotten three VA buyers into this market, which I thought would never happen. And the only way I could see through it was prospecting from reverse days on market, 
So go, if they're pre-approved for a million dollars, look at the 1 million one mark that had been sitting on the market. I know that doesn't really exist, but you know, similar to the expired canceled thing. Um, and then I would just say, uh, uh, put it back on their plate. So put it back on the seller's plate in terms of pressure. So if they have an offer deadline for Friday, put in an offer on Tuesday and just put it a ridiculous number, right? And then put the pressure back on them. And then if they decline it, great, move on. Um, but you know, we've had three buyers get into contract that are all VA buyers. So that's 0% down. Um, section one were cleared. You know, we got a $3 million VA buyer in up in, um, actually it was Andy C's listing um, uh, because it was sitting on the market for 30 days and they were getting nervous. And so they pulled the trigger and took our offer. And so there's ways around it and you just have to stay confident and diligent on the market and um, get creative. Awesome. Some great advice there, guys. Um, all right, let's take a couple more. So be vulnerable. What are you struggling with right now? What are you trying to elevate in your business? I got some uh, thing to ask. Um, so I'm, I'm new to the business. I've only been licensed since October and I'm part of uh, Enrique's team. My name is Harold. Um, one issue that I'm having with some of my buyers is a lot of them, you know, they, they don't really take your advice on what to offer based on the comps. You know, they look at the comps and they try to offer exactly at that comp or maybe slightly lower when we know that, hey, this comp is a month old. The market has appreciated since then. I recommend writing maybe 20,000, 30,000 higher at least, right? And then my buyers would still wanna go with whatever their, their feeling is, um, which I know is probably not gonna work. And then they lose out. And then after for being frustrated from losing out, they're like, hey, like the market's too hot for us. We don't, we don't want it. We want to pause our home search, right? But be, like, how do you guys tell your buyers like, hey, like I know it's difficult, but you should listen to the advice that I have. You know, let's keep at it. You know, like, you know, we're not always going to get our offer except from the very first try. Let's keep trying. So I'm, I'm going to hop in on this one because I love this and I, and I love that you're a newer agent going through this because it's, it's, it's common. So... The, the, what you just said, like, I, you should listen to me. I'm the trusted advisor here. Well, our consumers are super educated. They're very astute with the way that they're obtaining knowledge right now about the real estate industry. So we have to think about it from the onset. How do we make sure to set the framework of what's going to happen moving forward? You get a lead, they see a home, they don't want to, they, they like the home, they want to move forward. Well, Here's what's next. We take every single client through a buyer's presentation via Zoom, and we take them through from start to finish what happens when you start seeing homes, the tools, how to present our offer. And then we spend a lot of time talking about the strategy and how we're going to put our offer out to the listing agent. So when we talk about the strategy, I tell them, listen, you guys, it's my responsibility to educate you on what's happening in this local real estate market. I'm going to share with you the data. And based on the data is how we're going to form our strategy. I'm going to show you what houses are listing for, but also what they're selling for. And then how many offers on each home. Then collectively, we're going to decide on what the best strategy is based on the data. Now, Harold, at the end of the day, I'm going to write the offer that you want me to write, but I am here to keep this very real with you to be transparent. And I'm also going to be the person to tell you that you don't stand a chance and there's no reason for us to even write that offer because I've communicated with the listing agent. I know how many offers they have and we do not stand a chance in hell to even get our offer accepted. So let's not waste your time nor waste mine. They have to believe you from the onset that You've created the strategy. You understand. You've done your research. You've done your homework. So when it comes to write an offer, like, you know what, Mr. and Mrs. Buyer, that is, we don't stand a chance at that amount. And here's why. Here's the better strategy. Cool. If that's not the offer that you guys feel we can go in, and let's just walk from this one and let's move on and keep shopping. Right? You have to be willing to walk away from writing an offer because you don't feel that it's in the best interest of your time as well as theirs. Right? And there's a lot of agents that get led by the client thinking they know the market better than you do. You're the fucking expert. You're the one that knows more than they do. So you have to show that. And the way that you do that is all in your buyer's presentation. The buyer presentation sets the tone for everything that's going to come and moving forward. And then your strategy. You looked at the comps. You know you can release your, your appraisal contingency because there's a 1.3. You know it's going to appraise. You've looked at all the inspection reports. You say that there's no reason for them to keep a loan contingency. You've talked with their lender and their debt to income ratio is a 31%. You feel comfortable with them being able to fulfill the demands of the loan. This is what our strategy is. 
right? So you collect and collect and collect and get all this data. You help them understand based on that data is how we're going to determine the price. And if they still don't listen, we've done something wrong or you haven't had the turn. What I mean by the turn is that they're not fully in rapport with you. When you hit that turn with a client, something changes in their physiology and the way they communicate and the way they let their guard down. When you have that turn and you've identified that, they are in a position to say, you know what? We like you, we trust you, and we are going to follow your lead. I always tell my agents, you have to be two things in this business. You have to be a leader and you have to be a teacher. You have to lead them through this process, but you have to teach them all the things that they need to know in order to win and become homeowners in this competitive, fierce market. Gotcha. Thank right, you, guys. That helps Mike a lot. Drop. Mic drop right there, guys. The meeting is over. <laughs> that's some gold right there, bro. I, that's and I and Harold. So let me just give you some insight on Harold. Harold's on our team. Um, he's up and coming. He's you know just starting to branch off on his own. Um, right. And he's doing buyer presentations, right? But I think the big, the big lesson that you could take from, from Elias right now is you have to be the leader in your buyer presentation. And in order to be the leader, you can't be afraid to lose that client. You have to detach yourself from the outcome because once you detach yourself from the outcome, then you will say what is absolutely necessary for them to make you, to understand the market and understand what we gotta do to get this thing done. But if we're worried like, oh, I don't want to push too hard or I don't want to rub them the wrong way or I don't want to, you know, you know, insult them because they might go with someone else, we lost. And now you're just doing what most agents do of letting the client lead the, lead the whole transaction. So you have, to, you have to turn that up, bro. The aggressiveness has to turn up and you got to come from a place of I'm the leader, I'm the expert, and here's why you want to work with me because I'm not gonna tell you what you wanna hear. I'm gonna tell you what you need to hear so that you can get a home in today's market. And then I remember, this is one we've been doing lately is I'll, I'll stay quiet, say, do you guys hear that? You guys hear that? That's the, the price is going up, right? You, you can't hear it. The, the prices of homes are going up right now if you just listen closely, right? So the longer it takes for us to get you into a home, you now paid more for that home. Whereas if you guys take my advice, we're going to be able to get you into a home sooner and lock in into the, the market at a lower price, right? Make a joke out of it. Be funny. Say what you got to say. Like, take some risk, right? And that's how you're going to find that groove. And that's how you're going to be able to deliver for your clients. Harold, I'm going to encourage you to get a book. And it's for everybody. It's called Don't Split the, or, or Never Split the Difference. It's a negotiation book. And I highly recommend if you haven't read that book. It doesn't only give you negotiation skills with the listing agent, but also with your buyers and then all kinds of communication in life. Thank you. Appreciate all the help. That's so gangster, Enrique, that you said that you were like, you got to be willing to lose the buyer. Like that's the mentality. You got to go into this thing. You got to go into this thing saying, hey, I'm just going to lay it out there because I'm going to do what's best for them. I'm going to do what's best for my timeline. That was so good. Good. Dude. Cheers with my mimosa to that. Um, <laughs> I wish I had a mimosa. <laughs> yeah, it was a mimosa. Um, you know, I just wanted to add, you know, the just a little bit more on that specifically to you, Harold. Go, we have some really cool data in our specific MLS, and go to that sales price over time chart, track back to the last three years, and actually show them that sales price over time chart and show them how quickly the market's going up. Because when you look at that specific data chart, Right now, there's a fucking straight line up. Excuse my language. There's a straight line up to the last 60 to 90 days. And say, if you're looking at a home that sold 30 days ago, trying to make relevance of that, like it's not happening, right? We're all moving up so quickly in this specific market. Like we have to go way up above the next home price. And if we're not willing to do that, then that's okay. Then you don't want the home, right? I mean, that's just the reality. So, um, Bro, I'm yeah, glad you that you brought that up, man, because we had that conversation about comp catch up all the time. And Harold, I think this is a good opportunity for you to have the comp catch up. That if you're riding on a home that's listed for 750, based on what's happening, houses are selling for $100,000 over. Well, once that house closes and records, 
what do you think the next comp or the next benchmark for three bedroom, two bath in that community is going to be? So if we are thinking that the strategy of under is going to work, the market says something different. Now, when the houses are listed at 800, they're selling for 900. Now, do we even stand a chance? So like helping them see, like Danny was saying, like, where is the market at? Become an expert at the data because the data will help you really, really convey the message that the consumer needs to know right now. And as long as they're willing to lose at that price, as long as they're willing to lose at that price, hey guys, you know, let's just go on and keep on losing, right? Because that's what we're going to do. I mean, that's the conversation has to be like, don't sound like a smart ass like I am right now, but that's really what it is, right? Like if we want to just continue to lose, then we keep looking at the comps from 30 to 60 days ago. Um, the buyers that are winning in this market are the ones that are going up to get it. They're not the ones that are staying complacent. And that's where, if, if you're a listing agent on this call, you can raise your hand and attest to this. We're seeing offers come in. We're getting 12, 15, 20 offers and 80% of the offers are kind of hilarious, right? They're all, they're kind of like at list price or within five or 10% over asking. And then you have 20% of those offers that come in on your listing that are serious, right? They're, they're the ones who are going up on the deals. Um, and, and then those are the ones that we are countering. Um, so be in that 20% and then you have a chance. Thank you. And awesome. being a new, and I'm sorry, this Tabitha, being a new agent, uh, when I first started, you're just hoping to get in contract, whether or not they're truly able to win or, and it was a different market, you know, a couple of years ago, last year, but you really have to direct them and you not have to know your data. You could pay for outside data, but you get an opportunity here with this program, with this group here to learn. So if we could share more data, um, there's, you can go on Aculist on MLS, but you really need to be strong. You can't predict September. We can predict last, last quarter, this quarter, and what we see, but if you don't pay, it sounds like you're overpaying now, but your house is going to appreciate. Appraisals have not cut up. So when next September comes, you've, you know, you've already missed out, you know, within a month, the houses are increasing. So that's really important. You know, it's, it is scary to say, I, Hey, we're not going to win, but you got to know the data. They have to trust you and you got to trust yourself. So get, connect with this group and anyone else that could help you understand what you're looking at, what you're talking about, because we're very tech savvy, tech savvy, and they want to, question you <laughs> on your uh, knowledge ability and uh what you what you're trying to foresee for them yep uh, good stuff guys a lot of good info there um let's take one more guys so we're we're getting close to the end of this thing i wanted to keep this thing an hour uh let's take one more topic so who's give me something you're, you're struggling with something you need help on something you want to improve on uh, it doesn't have to be buyer related. It could just be anything in the business. And let's try to do our best to coach you. And then we're going to close it out. I have a buyer related question. Go for it. Yeah. My name is Emmanuel. I'm a part of uh, Enrique's team too. Um, this is a question for uh, Danny. Uh, kind of backtracking on what you mentioned. I know you mentioned uh, you were able to get a few bu VA buyers, uh, their offer accepted in the market. I just wanted to know, like, what was your process of finding that home with the section one clearance, or did you negotiate with the seller to clear the section one, or how did you go about that in this uh, competitive market? Yeah, so once again, the days on market, right? Like the days on market uh, immediately makes sellers start feeling queasy. Like if they don't sell, if they're not selling within 14 days, they're like, what's going on? Right. This was a mountain house. So this was up in the hills of uh, Los Gatos. Sorry, not Saratoga, Los Gatos. Um, so it's been, I think it was on the market for 29 days. Uh, there was a pretty large section one bill and we kind of lowballed them, to be honest with you, to start with. Uh, they came back and said, no, the sellers would rather do a price reduction. Than, and I said, OK, well, what are they thinking about doing a price reduction to? And they said 2.9. I said, OK, let's go to 2.95. That'll cover the section one clearance and it'll get them the price they need. We've structured the offer just like that, put it in, we ratified, and now we're doing $60,000 worth of section one work. It's a pain in the ass, but you got to do what you got to do. Um, so it was more of a technical thing, seeing kind of where that pressure point was with the seller. Um, like we came in at 275 and they almost laughed at us because they were up at like 32. And, um, and then they were like, we're going to, we would rather do a price reduction. And I just asked, where are you guys going on that price reduction? And they said two nine. And I said, okay, so if I can get you a two nine plus the section one clearance, are you guys good with that? They said, yes, clients wanted the house. So we built it in. Um, it doesn't always work out that way, 
but you you either need to find a coming soon or come in preemptively or flip it and and try to find the days on market and reverse prospect and then of course what enrique said is probably the best which is finding the off market opportunities through the canceled and expires um i, I mean you can't beat that because nobody's looking at those so Good stuff. So you you have you been able to uh, successfully get a VA buyer in a competitive situation, get their offer accepted? Like recently? yeah. So two weeks ago, we got a VA buyer in on a home that had just come on the market. Um, they hadn't set an offer deadline yet, but they were about to. And I just stuck in a pretty ridiculous offer um, in terms of the price, uh, and, and the sellers couldn't walk away from it. And that's what I meant by put the pressure back on the sellers. Are the sellers willing to risk going further to the offer deadline? and not getting the price that we just gave them, okay. right? So we put in a ridiculous number. Uh, you know, I think it was something like, you know, the house probably would have sold for 900. We went in at like 950, but we put an appraisal contingency on there. So it was a little sneaky, right? I knew the agent was inexperienced. So I knew that we could go up to a ridiculous number. And then if it doesn't appraise, we get to come back and renegotiate, right? So um, there was a little bit of a cat and mouse play there, but we went up higher than what the sellers were expecting and made them say no to that number. Um, I think that's pretty strong. Okay, sounds good. So you, so the, you were projecting this home to sell for nine hundred, and you offered fifty k over that. Okay, sounds good. And as long as your buyers are holding this house for a decade, we all know that that fifty k is not going to matter, right? Mm -hmm. If your clients are going to buy this house and only hold it for three years, you don't want to counsel them to go up to a ridiculous number. You're really burying them um, by doing so. So I would say the timeline on how long this buyer is holding that property is how aggressive you can counsel them as a fiduciary to go on the offer, right? If, they're, if this is a 20 year home for them, what's another 50K? Nothing, right? If you're looking at the longevity of an asset like, like class like this. So that matters a lot. Sounds good. Yeah, and getting your lender involved too in that, in that circumstance, right? Because it's it's at the end of the day it's, it's all money on paper it's about what the freaking payment is right especially if they're going to hold this house for 20 years so having your lender on standby like hey we're, we're probably going to go 50k more can we jump on a quick call so they understand what you know what their down payment is what their payment's going to be and all that good stuff um, because when you just say 50k more that sounds like a lot right if you're not putting any context to it but if, if 50k more is, is 100 bucks more on the payment and that's reasonable for them then you know, now you can, you know, get them to, to go along with you and make that deal happen. Can I add to something about a VA buyer real quick? Um, yeah, we had a VA buyer that we got into contract uh, up in Concord, or actually they closed on it. Um, and the way we, we uh, the section one was clear, um, but what we did is we said that, that they would go $20,000 above the appraised value of the home. Um, and we wrote that into the contract. So um, we submitted the offer and yeah, and, and the, the appraisal came in, came in about $20,000 low, but the buyers already knew, so they were fine with putting in the 20K above the appraised value. That's a good strategy right there that can make you stand out, right? Just say right off the bat, you're gonna pay over the appraised value mm -hmm. and put a dollar amount in there. Good, good stuff. stuff, guys. So we're, is there any final questions or anything? We're coming to a wrap here. Will you be giving out like, um, I think it was Elias that said he had like a presentation, a uh, plan of action. I have a plan of action, but I'd like to see more of, if, if you mind sharing what you do in your business when listing, when, uh, you know, I heard some really great points that I've wrote down, but is there anything that anyone's willing to share via email? Yeah, in the chat, there's, um, can you put one in there? It's our okay. um, spreadsheet. Yeah, it's in there. And then okay. our marketing timeline is on page two. And then we also do an offer review page where you can put all your offers on one page. Um, that's in there. And I also put a sample one that was filled out for a client most recently. So those are both in there. So uh, just grab them. Thank you so much. You got it. All right, guys. So that's it. First session. We're going to do this for 12 weeks. Um, so I appreciate your guys' time. I hope you guys learned something. Um, like I said before, the way you're going to pay me back is you take this information, you go back and you make something happen with it. Um, and you pay it forward, right? Teach other people, um, you know, help people get to the next level. Um, we'll see you guys back here next Wednesday, same time, 10 to 11 a.m. We'll keep it short, one hour. Bring your questions, share it, invite people. I'm going to be, you know, putting this out on, on social media.
but let's keep this group going and see if we can get this group to grow to grow bigger. Uh, if you guys need anything offline, hit me up, send me a direct message. Um, love to chat with you. If, if, you know, if there's any other questions that didn't get answered today, I can do my best to give you some pointers and feel free to reach out to anybody. A lot of people put their contact info in the, uh, the chat here. So make sure you reach out. You guys now know uh, Elias, Kenny, uh, Danny, some big hitters, some guys doing big things. So reach out. I know these guys always are always looking to contribute and help people out. So um, thank you guys. Have a great day. Let's make it successful. All right, brother. Thank you.